composition, and I've mostly been just amusing myself <laughs> while they work. <laughs> um, uh, we've been working on the Biomuse Trio since November, um, and so far it is a two movement piece, and today we're just going to present some portions of it. Um, so during this open studio event, we wanted to take the opportunity to share some of the concepts and the techniques behind the Biomuse Trio. And basically, I'm going to conduct a kind of a short interview with Ben and Eric. And this will be followed by a performance of the trio in what Ben likes to call its current and incomplete state. <laughs> and then we'd like to take some questions from the audience. Um, OK, so Eric, my first question is for you. You conceived of the Biomuse Trio as a piece of chamber music in the traditional sense of the word. You wanted to create a work that would be as kind of precisely composed as a traditional piece of chamber music um, and everything that comes with this. So like intimate levels of communication between the performers, precise coordination between the different parts, etc. So can you tell us a little bit about where this idea came from and what makes it unique or significant in relation to the current repertoire of computer interactive music? Sure. <laughs> 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 it was sort of like Jeopardy in the sense that you answered the question and then, then you asked it. Uh, but um, it, it kind of worked for me as, as a composer coming both from the instrumental world for a long time. I, I composed instrumental music before um, I went over the, to the dark side of computer music. And so um, over the years, I developed both uh, strategies for processing sound. Um, basically created DSP um, techniques, as well as writing for instruments. And at a certain point, as, um, as uh, personal computers started getting fast enough to do interesting things uh, live to sound, it, it seemed very natural to combine those, those two elements. At, at the same time, I was very aware that a large um, amount of um, the work that was uh, happening in, in terms of laptop performance seemed to be um, in, in the direction of uh, improvisation, I think in part that's just because uh, there isn't a very good um, notational system for electroacoustic music. So naturally, we would uh, gravitate towards music that was not so much written down. Um, but I, I got very interested in, in the notion, well, really two notions. One is what would happen if um, not, not just the methods of, of processing the sounds, but act, the actual musical patterns were uh, predetermined with, um, with a degree of precision as in the case of traditional composition. And at the same time, I was very interested in the idea of um, integrating the computer as a musical instrument with the sort of performance intimacy that, that we generally associate with classical chamber music. So in, in a sense, the, the ideas that were driving this music are, are all rather, rather traditional ones. But at the same time, I wasn't really aware of, of too many people who were are, who are doing this, this sort of um, approach. Um, I think Court Lippy maybe would be a composer who had been doing this sort of thing a little bit earlier. Um, but but I, maybe the main difference between what Court is, was doing and what I was doing is that um, the computer part and the performance of it is really considered to be kind of um, working, working behind the scenes. Um, in this case, I wanted the instrument itself to be more of a performance instrument. Now, that was getting me into a, a, a sort of world of computer chamber music, and I, I did compose um, a, a, actually a few pieces before, prior to working the, the Biomuse Trio. Uh, I made a piece for string quartet and computer, um, for two winds and computer, and mixed ensemble. And all of those, the um, laptop had a, uh, performer had a rather extravagant amount of things to do. Uh, and th in fact, quite uh, dangerous um, performance things, because um, all, all of the pieces that I made were based on the, on the uh, principle of live sampling, so that everything that's um, that you hear from the computer is sampled from um, the performance, and very specific pieces of material have to be sampled at the right time. So if you miss a note, you, you may literally be missing large chunks of music um, three or four minutes down the road. So there was a lot of this kind of stuff constantly. Um, and <clears throat> coming out of that, um, I was having conversations with, uh, with my colleague Ben about the possibilities of, um, of, of bio control and using bio signal signals as, as um, essentially musical instruments. 
and it struck me that there was a there was a possibility here for a division of labor where um, it was very obvious that that um, the laptop was a, a fairly uh, inferior performance interface, um, and at the same time, the uh, human body could be an extremely elegant um, gestural performance interface. So it seemed interesting to explore the notion of chamber music, but um, develop a split personality where, where the computer performer would be more um, grabbing pieces of things, maybe orchestrating the way um, the computer would be processing the sound, but then um, turning over the performance aspect to um, a um, human body as, wow. as an instrument. That segues really nicely into my next question for Ben. Um, so as an engineer, you've had a long history of designing hardware and software that measures and, and enables interaction with human body signals, for example, heart rate, brain wave, skin impedance, uh, muscular tension, and so on. So can you talk a little bit about the devices that you're using here in the Biomuse Trio and explain to us how they function in the technological sense? And then Eric, maybe you can describe a little bit how they function musically. Sure, I don't know how many people were here last week gave a little bit of a talk on, on some of this stuff. I think probably about half of you were here. Um, but a sense, uh, well, in today's piece, we'll be using um, uh, sensors that measure muscle tension in my arms, um, both forward and back tension, and also sensors that measure the um, position of my arms up and down um, rotationally. Um, so you'll see with this particular piece, um, and at least segments of this piece, that it concentrates a lot on gestures that surround this space because of the sensors around the forearms. Obviously, then it's all going to be about creating stuff within this space here. Um, we've uh, previously been working on gestures that we use sensors all over the body for even larger types of um, uh, physical gestures as well as um, looking at uh, other aspects of human physiology. Actually, now that you mentioned that most of the gestures are happening in that space, I think if the audience can't see that stuff, if it's being blocked by the um, music, <laughs> that it might be an idea to like that's why I'm sitting on these yeah. gallows here. We had, not, we had not actually planned on sitting up here. I, feel very I don't know, because a, a lot of the piece interactions are happening right here in front of like Ben's monitor. Okay, so... Um, Can you help me answer the musical yeah. question? I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 <laughs> I don't know how relevant yeah. it is tonight, but... Um, again, in a very traditional way, um, I'm treating... Um, Ben as a performer, as a performing classical musician, uh, with very specific kinds of uh, gestures notated in, into the score in terms of you do this, perform, usually actually some action. Very, uh, and, and I should actually stress that all, although I've um, composed most of the music, Ben has actually choreographed the performance. So I, I, I think in no case, or at least very few if any cases, did I say, move this part of your body to make something happen. And it would be more in the score, a very specific thing happens, and then we would discuss it, and Ben would uh, first come up with um, an idea of what biosignal might be most appropriate to make that happen. And then beyond that, he would chore choreograph his gesture to, to make it appropriate. So, so there's, um, there's a lot of sort of overlap in terms of um, composition, choreography, interpretation that goes back and forth between the two of us. But the actual gestures, the actual musical things that Ben, ben is making happen are all um, all notated in, in the score. Um, there are a couple of sections that are um, just creating an environment in which Ben can improvise. But um, there are many, many more sections where, for example, Ben has to trigger a chord. You'll see him make a gesture, you'll hear the chord. It's a, a, a direct relationship. The only other thing I add to that is, as is so often the case when one um, addresses a new instrument, one brings older ways of thinking about instruments that one is familiar with. And I think that I'm, I'm as uh, guilty of that as anyone. So very, uh, in a way, my, my writing for Ben's instrument uh, is, is very much uh, sort of traditional musical writing. However, there are a few places where I'm starting to veer into things which I think are more idiomatic for the body and the biomuse signals in the sense that in a few places I have 
been um, creating an environment for, for Ben in which he's doing a number of different gestures that create a kind of correlated, um, <clears throat> a cor correlated uh, transformation of sound, which I think would be impossible or at least very difficult to do in, in any other way. So I think that we're kind of moving, we're, we're, we're learning more about this instrument. I, I think as we do, I'll be able to co compose more idiomatically for, for what it is. Yeah, the instrument I think will continue to develop as we do so. Yeah, I think to complete that thought, I, I, Gossi and I were talking yesterday about the fact that um, composing for traditional musical instruments is about um, you know, the, the composer, I don't want to put too much on it, but the composer knowing what that instrument sounds like and saying, okay, play this, make this sound, and then it's up to the violinist, for example, to read the notes and, and make that sound. Whereas with gesture, Eric would ask, said, I want you to control such and such. And then it was a matter for the designing <coughs> gesture that could actually um, control that, have an effect on that control surface. And that was really the difference between designing for gesture versus designing for instrument. Yeah. Okay. Um, two more questions. Okay, so I guess we'll try to keep it brief. But what are some of the difficulties or challenges that arise when dealing with gestural interfaces such as this one? Um, from the perspective of someone who's witnessed the development of this work, I can see that there's a lot of fine tuning um, along the lines of examples uh, setting thresholds. So sometimes when we're in rehearsal and Ben will do this and just a slight gesture you know, will have to be finely tuned in terms of the thresholds that are set the next time this much is um, you know, too much, or sometimes this much is too much. There's always calibration happening and fine tuning. So my question is, can you tell us about the scale um, on which these devices and signal processing functions are operating, and your approach to developing instruments and also musical ideas on that scale? Because that's one of the interesting things I found, is like the fine uh, grain uh, on which you're working. Mm -hmm. Maybe Ben should address uh, I think it's a very tough area for just gestural work in general, and we'd like to design things that are scale independent and, and certainly calibration independent. And that's some of the work we've been doing here at Stein is trying to figure out other ways of creating gestures that I don't have to be calibrated specifically to me. Um, uh, because actually, yes, we're we're looking at the subtleties, and part of the piece that um, Eric and I have been talking about that has not yet been composed is to even start looking at exploring very, very fine gestures. Although there is a, you know, a situation where the audience can you actually see if I make very fine gestures, is it, is it important to have that? Um, but, but yeah, I think, I think there's a whole issue associated with um, designing things for the size of gesture and calibrating for the individual on the day. Um, the classic example we always give of um, measuring muscle tension is that um, when I work with performers myself, designing instruments for them, um, they're nervous on the day, so all of a sudden, all of those calibrations that we set up are, are thrown out the window because they're all of a sudden really tense to begin with, and, and then you have to go from there. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really important issue. Yeah, it's, it's so sensitive to you know all the uh, things that the body is experiencing at the moment. The only thing I would uh, just add on the musical side is um, <clears throat> before getting into this piece, and I can still. Um, I've, I've always been terrified of, of hardware, and I mean, I I love writing software to um, transform music in, in various ways, and I'm still using um, you know, DSP programs I wrote 20 years ago. Uh, whereas I've seen so much hardware as being ephemeral, and even even more scary is uh, homebrew hardware that people make for a particular piece and then you know, use it for a few years, and then it breaks and goes into the closet, and that's the end of things. So that that scared me. But uh, at the same time, um, in, in some of my conversations with Ben, it, it became clear that there, um, there's emerging a way of thinking about gesture that really goes behind and beyond the hardware itself. And that, that, I think, is where we're going. We're starting to think about gestures that are musical, that are expressive, increasingly so, and that as, as our knowledge of what these things are, what gestures are, and as our ability to um, um, build sensitive hardware, um, it improves, you can, you can actually, in a sense, compose for the hardware that you have now with a reasonable expectation that a few years down the road, far from your hardware being obsolete, 
there'll be better hardware that will do that will be able to realize your ideas even better than they can now. Perfect. That actually answers my last question, which was what are the next steps or what are some of the ideas that you're thinking of now? So maybe we can end the interview portion now. And um, I don't know, maybe if the audience, whoever can't see Ben's hands, if you want to take different seats, we can also do a little bit of shifting around. Sure. And, and just to describe that, um, we, as um, Gassia mentioned, we're um, here for a one-week residency at Stein, where we're working on this whole piece that's going to be performed um, in June at, at the New Instruments for Musical Expression Conference. And we're really only about halfway through. And so uh, uh, hopefully, uh, there's going to be, we'll show you snippets of what we're doing and what we're working on. It's not necessarily a complete piece yet. yet. And it will be given in two parts. Um, and halfway through, very similar to, to what you guys did, about halfway through, um, things will come to a grinding halt and we'll reboot um, the Mac and shut down the whole electricity and bring it back on again um, and uh, probably do a few uh, uh, prayers and then we'll, <laughs> we'll start it up again. Um, so we'll see. But you'll know that this time it was planned to be that way. <laughs> Just so you know, it's, what's on the screen in front of me is actually not where we are on the piece, because I've got the music sitting here, um, but actually just uh, there are certain parts of the piece where I actually need to know where I am in the gesture, um, uh, at least where the computer thinks I am in the gesture, and so um, that's what I'm looking at right there. Should I just show them? Um, yeah, if you're <laughs> yeah. 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 So if Ben uh, doesn't move movement, you'll see numbers moving around and little things flashing. That's about <laughs> the extent of my understanding of the actual signal processing that's happening there. But things <laughs> happen on this screen Anything. and that tells us that things are working right. Actually, I'm having a real hard time re reading the score. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this I can read. The score is, is like nearly impossible. Yeah, so this is the monitor. This is monitor. Right, so One of the things we have to do is make sure that Ben is nice and calm before I start my max app to the voice and be sort of flying around the room before we want them to. Are you nice and calm, Ben? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Total Zen state. That's what we need to know. Asi, <clears throat> would you like to play just a little bit so that we know that the time's up?
Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask again when Ben uh, is comfortable. It's really nice. Seeing, you know, as a closer, you usually get an opportunity to ask your uh, performers how comfortable they are. Also, I hope you're comfortable too. <laughs> Why you look your back? Do you need us to talk? Oh no, 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 we are ready to go. A little more light, just a little bit. Oh, thank you. I'm 46, and I'm slightly my own. <laughs> okay, I think we are ready to attempt the second part. This is. <clears throat> that, that first thing is more or less a complete movement. This is about maybe two thirds of the next part of the piece. <laughs>
been right, but went wrong. <laughs> I was yeah. wondering uh, if all the it's all the sounds that you produced were um, taken from the violin, or if there were some of them were free samples. All from the violin. All, everything is made out of uh, sound that's captured live. Um, I think that makes things more exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Things right on the edge, actually. Like <laughs> <laughs> of course, if you ever watched a note go by that you were just supposed to sample. Then exciting is no longer the right word for it. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I've heard the, uh, of course, the, the scientific and the technical realization of what you're doing is kind of complicated. Um, still, from a um, performance aspect, I'm, I'm curious if, to know where you're interested in going with the meaning of gesture since we all of us share gestural communication every second of every day that we never get to find. Um, so I'm just curious, since the music will never exactly come from the physical gesture that we see, how how is the relationship to the instrument you're trying to develop as you speak to that? It's well, I guess it's, both men and I will have different uh, answers. I'll yeah. give you mine very quickly. Um, which is that I, I find um, musical gesture incredibly beautiful and incredibly subtle. Um, it, it's, it's part of instrumental performance. We are not yet, I think, able to capture very much of that um, into the music directly, but I'm, I'm certain that, that we're going in that, in that direction. And I think that, in a sense, something like the relationship between dance and music that already exists is going to develop between um, musical performance gesture and, let's say, the uh, sonic aspect. I think one of the hardest things in working last week and, and for a while, but here last week it's time, and again, looking at <coughs> technical pattern recognition of gestures, but um, gestures, if you talk about speech gestures and recognizing speech and, um, and gestures for, you know, at um, video or picture images is one thing, um, but gestures when it, it's part of a musical performance, obviously we want to recognize a given gesture, but then we don't want to say, oh, okay, that's done. We want to say, okay, we recognize a gesture, now what is the control that that gesture affords us? And that's where things get really, really tricky and, and a lot different than all of the other gestural recognition problems that are out there. It's really, now it, recognizing a gesture is only the beginning of it. Yeah. Well, I got two questions. Um, first of all, to get it straight, is it is it you said that you took all the music from the sound that the violin made, but I you contribute too. I mean, not just manipulation of what she does, but mm -hmm. you generate your own stuff. So do, what you generate, the signal that you generate, is used to manipulate the sounds that you make. All right. All right. Okay. It actually goes well. One part of the component of the sound goes that way, that way, and out. Well, that way, that way. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yes, the sound is collected from her, um, and then it's given to, um, to Eric, and then I control what Eric um, has there and what he's set up. And that's why you know it's really difficult um, in actually keeping all of this together. I, I see it's difficult, but nevertheless, my next question would be. Um, when I started playing the guitar when I was very young, it was because I had seen people on TV do that, and I thought, I want to do that. How far is the point do you think that I could do the same thing at home with the portable equipment? Well, I think that's... Maybe just one or two sensors, I mean, not all over. But that's what um, Eric was talking about. I think that the answer to your question just a few years ago would have been, um, you know, five or 10,000 euro and, and good luck. Yeah. Um, and now the sensors that I have on are commercially available and and duplicative. There, there are many um, sources for the same kinds of sensors. Um, in, the, in the technical talk I gave last week, I actually put up a slide of all the different companies that sell these kinds of sensors, um, varying in price from you know 100 euro up to, you know, to thousands of euro, depending on what you want to do. Um, the last part of your question, though, is you know hooking it up. To a, the, to a Mac, I think it's very straightforward, or to other software that's free, it's straightforward. Um, how I, the patch that Eric has put together to do all of this gets quite complicated, but to get started would be very easy. All right. Go 
also say that right now the you know the guitar of hero trade has reached a billion dollar scale. So that I know several companies think one would like this minute to produce an instrument that will be not air instruments but real real instruments again, but made for you. So we could do <laughs> what Ben does. Well something in that order. So you're shifting from guitar to to Oh well <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a, that's a that's a bit far fetched, but what it's, it's, it had a connection to what uh, what the lady uh, mentioned. That I think it builds more of a relation between you and the audience when we sort of know what you're doing, when we can relate to it a little bit. You show me the senses. Yeah. <laughs> Take it off. 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 Take it That's, this has basically got, uh, underneath the Nike, did not sponsor this, by the way. <laughs> um, Nike brings you Stein. <laughs> um, uh, underneath the Nike is the accelerometer, so that's what's measuring the, uh, the, um, the position and rotation of my hand. Um, and um, underneath the, the two other straps are the um, two EMGs to get this and to get that. Um, and even what you see here has been replaced. Um, we have sensors that we were using this time last week um, uh, that are only around, well, uh, all depend on, you, on your price point. Uh, they're 300 euro, um, and they have um, uh, three degree of freedom, pitch roll, and yaw. They have um, uh, all, any yaw motion, um, any motion you can possibly imagine, and they all come in a package about that size. Um, and then you can plug in things like the EMG bands, and, you can even, as I was at the talk last week, I had ECG and uh, EEG and anything that begins with an E and ends with a G. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the resolution of this muscle? How, how much? It, it's, it's, yeah. it's a, you know, I've been, ever since I started, it's, it's a trade off between um, steadiness and, ac and, and sensitivity. So um, it's something that dynamically. If you want to get a gesture that's as subtle as that, um, then you, you obviously can't have this huge filter on it smoothing it out. The nature of the muscle is that when I, as you saw, I start to shake. When you, when you flex the muscle, you start to shake. So if you want a nice steady level, you have to smooth it out a lot, and which then lowers the, the time sensitivity of it. So you have to have dynamically trading off between time sensitivity and this ability to have nice smooth um, articulations. How are sensors connected to the computer? Uh, wirelessly, Bluetooth. Huh. Which was one of the fun things, because yeah. half, half the time in a rehearsal it was like... Because <laughs> 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 you know, the Bluetooth sort of goes by way of Africa, and then somehow it's <laughs> <laughs> that computer. And there's a skin impedance measuring... This, this is actually, I'm not wearing a GSR, which would be skin impedance, I'm measuring... Um, something called EMG, which is actually measuring the um, neuronal activation of the muscle itself. So it's the neural activity. Um, so that's why it doesn't measure motion. If you simply change the amount of tension underneath it, you get more neural firings, and that causes more electricity to flow. That gets amplified and then sent over that way. What's a galvan? <laughs> a galvan? Um, that's a nail. Um, um, it's Gal Gal an Italian guy. It's an Italian guy on the body. He did horrible things with frogs that we won't even talk about. Um, but one of the things he did was he, um, he measured, created uh, something that measured current. And that's what actually you measure in the um, palms of your hands and the bottoms of your feet, which is um, used for measuring um, aspects of stress and emotional state. And so that's what Gal Gal skin response is. Yeah, lie, lie detector. Lie detector, exactly. The first signal of the lie detector. What does it put out? Does it put out MIDI or does it work kind of for all the... This, this particular transmitter I'm using is a commercial one and it actually can stream either raw data or MIDI. Um, most of the other ones that are on the market um, just stream raw data and then you pull it into the serial on PD or Max or whatever software you're using um, and then you interpret that data. And most of them come with the blocks. They can use more than one of 27 uh, specs. Oh yeah, so then um, the one I have right now is 10-bit, um, but uh, a lot of the commercial ones out now are actually 12-bit. So 4,096, yeah. I'm gonna, at the beginning of your piece, when, when you were looking at each other and there was, there was some delay with the, with the cord that came, was, was that the Bluetooth? Um, 
that probably, if I were betting, is one of two things. Um, either my incompetence um, uh, or my level of nervousness. Because um, what would happen, change the calibration? Uh, well, yeah, because what happened is I started out being really tight in the beginning, and then I was like, oh, crap. Um, so, yeah, we had to get that. And that, this is what's really, when, you, when you're doing the, the pieces that have been done so many times using systems like that, as Eric was describing, where you um, have a lot of looseness, you, you can overcome some of the, um, the idiosyncrasies of the instrument itself. Um, but when Eric has thousands of notes on a page, you don't have any time to, to screw up, and so you, you do what you do when you mess up with the piano, you kind of move on really quickly and, and get back on into it. Where, where's the calibration done? In the hardware or in the software? Software, software. Yeah. What would happen if another musician, uh, such as a master of this choreography, you put on the sensor and did the same thing? Would it uh, produce something meaningful, or would it have to be totally redone? You mean that this particular piece? And stuff. Yeah. The yeah. calibration would be the one thing that would be redone, and everything else would be the same. Calibration is easy, by the way. Um, I mean, we <clears throat> at, at um, the outset, it, it was a bit laborious, but we. Kind of systematized it, so we would probably calibrate this this whole thing in uh, maybe ten minutes or so. So, and then you know, swap in another performer. They wouldn't be bad, <laughs> <laughs> but but they would be better. But they should they should be performable by by another person who is able to control their um, galvanic stimulus or whatever. Um, have, you, have you tried any kind of dynamic this is actually one of the things we were working on here uh, last week, was actually looking at, um, because you're one of the, again, the EMG is really the classic one of those things where over the course of the piece you relax. And, and so you, you need to dynamically adapt the calibration, um, but it's tricky. And we were wrestling with that a lot last week, trying to figure out how that works. I'm, I'm curious what, uh, I was wondering myself whether you feel yourself uh, similar to a performer or similar to a conductor yeah. in a sense of sometimes it seems that you're giving cues and those things are happening let's say program wise uh, although coming from in real time and coming from the, the, the live symbol source and sometimes you're manipulating more but that is fearing complex process so I, I couldn't decide myself whether you would call yourself a conductor or a performer I mean those of course Eric's uh, uh, also had moving away well, I guess, but I'm curious about I mean, a conductor is a performer of a, a certain type. I mean, somebody who plays a theremin is a performer of a certain type. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's a range of different kinds of things, as, as, as you noticed. And I, I, we're probably more interested in enriching the vocabulary of, of what he does. Um, I think it would I mean, be I mean, more in the sense of instrumentalist, because <coughs> if you play an instrument, something you also would have to train. And you at a certain moment become skillful in, in playing the instrument. Mm -hmm. And I was also wondering, for example, here, uh, whether each time a similar gesture has a similar effect or it is changing all the time throughout uh, the piece. Which would make it more difficult to call it an instrument because it's completely dynamic. Let's say if it's all in purpose of the composition, it's different than when it's more coherent in the sense of an instrument that you can start to master certain movements because of certain effects. Well, strictly speaking, the instrument is the entire system. I mean, the, in, in this case, the instrument is Gossia playing violin, Ben playing um, fine muse, and, and me playing computer. So even though, in a, in a sense, they, there, there may either be an, an intended identical response from Ben, when that identical response hits the chord that I sampled tonight, it's going to make something different than, uh, subtly different, perhaps, than uh, another performance. So in, in, uh, in among the system of the entire trio, it, it, it really, I think, is an instrument that, that is, um, like, like any musical performance of a composed piece, is going to be different uh, every time. Um, but I guess the only, the only thing, other thing that I would say is that um, I wouldn't necessarily want, want to distinguish uh, say performer conductor, but I'm definitely thinking of what Ben is doing as a musical performance, but whatever that might mean. It's not it's not a, a technical thing. It really is um, Ben knowing the instrument, knowing the music, and then um, performing.
perform the music video in, in accordance with that. Does, does that answer the question, sir? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, curious, a little bit, yeah. I'm curious, for example, the way I, I seem to see it, but maybe I'm totally off, is the band all the time trying to make the best gesture for the purpose of the performance or the composition instead of feeling comfortable of playing the instrument and being trained or to have, having trained to play the instrument as instrument instead of all, uh, all the time serving the execution of the composition? That's a good question. And I, I, I actually think, in part, that is because some of the writing, especially um, in, in the first part, is relatively unidiomatic for his instrument. I think part of that was because as I was coming into this thing, I didn't uh, yet fully understand what his instrument did. So I think I called for some things that were not that, that were a little awkward for him to do. Um, at, at the same time, Ben had, you know, was able to meet me um, more than halfway to, to make those things happen. So that would be a situation where you know, Ben seems to be trying really hard to do something, and you just hear a chord, and you say, well, couldn't you just come like that? But I think at the same time, we have other kinds of situations that are happening later in, in, in the second section, where, where Ben is actually doing uh, more complex motions that involve um, motion, tension, and it's a multi-parametric stream of things um, that, that, that is, in fact, becoming more uh, idiomatic to the instrument and really does give Ben the um, um, freedom of expression with, with that instrument as a special thing that can do something that uh, a harpsichord can, for example. It kind of reminds me of the many myriad uh, interfaces that are being, have been being made in the last decades uh, in the world of sign, um, only yours is you know, from, the, from the sensors on your body, but um, the hand this device is and um, the sign is a prime example, but, but so many others in between. Um, I mean, any, any really uh, interface is the same kind of thing. There is no idiom for the music. You, can, you, you could design a musical idiom for the gestures, but as you say, you wouldn't want to have the same um, music every time you do this. Or you could. You could decide for one piece for every certain gesture, and you could make a legend in the score. That would be a certain kind of music, or crescendo, or cellarando, or what, whatever you wanted. But it's always, it's, it's not by definition ever absolute. That's what I'm saying. Where by with the harpsichord, there is an absolute time when the sound comes, right. with a certain amount of pressure on the music. So I think that's also the fascinating thing. Yeah, that kind of um, what your comment is speaking to what Ben was saying earlier about yeah, the gestures are certainly not mapped out in any absolute sense. Whereas you know, if I do this on the violin, yeah. it's always going to sound like that. <laughs> you know, if it's yeah. in that tuning or whatever. Um, and if I'm doing, using the same pressure, etc. But um, Ben, in this case, is uh, how are you describing it in terms of? Uh, finding gestures that will control kind of a larger scale of things, like it's not just mapping one to one a gesture onto um, you know a musical outcome. It's more finding a uh, gestural control interface for certain musical kinds of. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think correct? what I see is that because we don't see human bodies and objects the way we see bodies and objects, especially in music. So the issue is now suddenly you have no object. Um, there's still an object. The object is now your body. There's something dancers about, but in music it's not the way you like to think about it. And maybe that's what you can see. I do too. See, this, see it as a choreographic or a conducting gesture rather than, than a specific to the musical touch. But and I think that's just the territory. You, you have to make those decisions. Like, this is physically there. Mm -hmm. got more well, you, you move between, I mean, this is the thing. If you, if you recognize a sequence of gestures and cause actions to happen by the sequence of gestures, then you're treading on the conductor paradigm. If you are following generality, yeah, but if you follow the the gesture, the recognition of the gesture with this continuous control, then all of a sudden it very much to me feels like an instrument. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm doing something. It really feels like I'm playing something, and I find it very. I mean, I grew up playing, you know, polyphones and, you know, 
and stuff, right? And and Rollins and then Korg's and um, you know you, you you do the same gesture and you had a different sound, um, and even had, the sound even had a different envelope to it, and it started to get a little more elaborate. And then all of a sudden it was a drum machine. You're hitting the same keys and making drum sounds and things like that. Now are you conducting the drums and are you conducting these things or are you playing them? And, and where's the boundary between that? And what I like is that I then, you know, this was the talk last week, I have this fetish for the, the ability to play physical instruments and then move back from them um, so that you have the physical interface and, and moving back. This is a piece that surround, entirely leaves the physical interface behind. Um, but that moving between the physical gesture, and I honestly don't know the answer to Edmund's question of, of whether it's conducting or playing. I know it feels to me very much more like a musical instrument than conducting, like now, now, now. I very rarely in the piece with there a now, now, and much more often as there's something I was manipulating continuously. So you're not really giving commands. Yeah. You are doing learned gestures, <laughs> and then there is also some room um, for kind of musical expression, especially in some of the more improvised areas, right? Where your gestural, you, where your gestures don't have to be as precisely notated or composed in a sense. Or you can um, also do things on the spot, right? Yeah. yeah but will you, if you compose another piece, will the same gestures do the same thing in the next piece? They do something different. I mean, that's that's really one of the nice things about um, the modern muse. Uh, system as an instrument. Uh, I think I agree 100% uh, with Joel that, that essentially the, the human body is the instrument. And the interface actually, at least in my thinking, and I think I had the luxury to do this, whether fairly or not, is I don't care about the interface. That's, that's kind of Ben's problem. But also it's sort of like these, these wires and things are kind of you know, generic pieces of stuff that can be replaced with, with other generic pieces of stuff. And that seems like a very different thing than a traditional music, musical instrument. If you really get to know a violin well, your, your own violin and live with it for, for years, um, you're gonna have a very different experience if you play on another violin. You do know how to play violin in some generic sense, but the uh, personality of the instrument is important to you. Um, maybe here there are idiosyncrasies that you try to root around, but um, it's, it's really um, the human body. So to get, get back to your, um, your question, um, certainly, we're, we're learning um, about certain kinds of things that Ben can do, whether it's this or that. Um, these these are all part of the vocabulary. Uh, and it's <coughs> interestingly, Ben Ben uh, was sometimes during during our rehearsals complaining, "Oh, I have to you know do this thing again. Um, aren't we bored of that yet?" But then we found that you know when you know this thing controlling one kind of sound. Um, in one kind of musical context is a very different thing than a different context. Just like if you think about doing that to a piano, it's a hundred different thing situations. Um, so I, I actually don't don't feel constrained by that. Rather, rather I feel that you know we're, we're developing a vocabulary which um, is admittedly I think quite primitive right now, but is inevitably um, going, going to grow in, in sophistication and um, and in ex expressivity. At least that's that's my belief at this point. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>